together to have some important conversations. Um, so I, my name is Nancy Bagatelle and I'm the division director here at UNC. And I'm really, really pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sue Coppola. So Sue is somebody that probably needs no introduction <laughs> to most of you. Um, Sue has been a part of our UNC OSOT community for many, many years. Um, she got her master's degree here in 1985 and uh, finished her post-professional degree at Boston University in 2017. Uh, Sue has, as most of you know, has many varied interests and areas of expertise, including interprofessional education and practice, particularly around aging, the arts and humanities pedagogy, quality of life during chemotherapy for older adults, international practice and education, and of course, ethics and care, which is why we invited her here this evening. Uh, Sue has published extensively, contributing chapters in many OT textbooks, as well as many publications in OT journals, and has served on local, national, and international boards. Um, you, some of you may know Sue retired in the fall, mm -hmm. however, um, and not surprisingly, Sue was extremely busy, um, staying active in all things OT, um, and uh, has even taken on the role of the Society for the Study of Occupation Conference Chair, which is keeping her very busy. Um, and she agreed to do this this evening. So we're really, really pleased. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Coppola. Mm -hmm. So Nancy, that was a little longer than you promised, but we'll we'll go forward with it. Um, I just want to just flash back to this welcome screen and uh, move to a slightly different view for um, for our folks who are coming in virtually. It is really an honor to be here um, to be asked to come and speak and find out that I hadn't completely forgotten how to talk. <laughs> and um, and could wear things other than my pajamas now that I'm retired. But um, anyway, it's it's a real pleasure to to be here. And um, I hope that what I can offer you is something that will add to your thinking, your comfort about ethics. There are so many ways that we can approach the topic of ethic uh, ethics, and um, this hopefully will give you some food for thought. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Um, so here's the key points. I know you're supposed to give the key points, right? Very, um, from the beginning, and I'll finish with them too. First of all, the main thing I hope you see is that OTs have skills for approaching ethics. And we sometimes forget that we have those skills but we understand how to analyze situations. That's what we do all day long. So we can analyze power. We can, anal we can engage our moral courage. Our work is courageous work. And we can balance and target our actions, our advocacy. And basically what I want us to leave with the feeling is that we are made for this. So this is a little bit more um, of a process of, um, you know, breaking down the situation. So similarly, the agenda will be talking about the uh, situation of ethics in OT, types of power, and hopefully it kind of unpacks different forms of power. Um, we'll kind of look at what moral courage is, so a lot of different ideas about that. And then, uh, and then refer to advocacy as you know our final action. And then there'll be a quiz. No. <laughs> well, I would like that, but but maybe the people online will come come back at the end. <laughs> okay. So, is this our story when we think about ethics? There's the David and Goliath, or uh, David and Jalut. Uh, story that occur in the Old Testament, in Judeo-Christian, and also in the Quran, uh, and with the name of Jalut. Um, and there's this myth, myth that we have um, independent action, 
that as one person, we can pull out our slingshot and slay the giant, that there's a right person and there's a wrong person. And what we're after is winning. And of course, none of the above is true, right? Um, in fact, the reality of justice is that power is multifaceted. There's a lot of dimensions and forms of power, ways to get it, ways to lose it. That courage is integral to what we do. And that finally, advocacy is a collective process and it takes time. This is a Durham Civil Rights mural um, that really illustrates uh, a, a lot of our long history in the United States of uh, working toward civil rights. It's a long, long process. So ethics and moral distress in OT, this is a pretty common problem. Get rid of that. No, I can't. Okay. I'm screen sharing. Um, so, uh, Everybody experiences these all day long, um, and we how hard we take it varies. Um, ooh, wrong way. Um, so a key point is that every decision, whether it's deciding how much time you're going to spend with Mr. Smith, how much time you're going to take with this note, how much you're going to talk with this teacher about this child, what you're going to say, they're all basically ethical decisions within all action. Now, um, in OT practice, there's a lot of talk, a lot of writing about ethics, and we don't really immediately think of it, but when the, the articles in May of 2024 in OT practice talked about how to get power mobility for children, is that not a justice matter? Increasing funding for Medicaid, DEI and academic leadership, cognitive and mental health for people in nursing homes and participation for autistic adults at work. So this is, I mean, you see all the ethical pieces of these sort of informational articles just by their title. Um, so the first task that you have, it's sort of an assignment, um, is to think about an ethical situation that troubles you. Now, how do you know that it troubles you? You think about it, it's on your mind. A little trouble sleeping. You want to talk about it or you don't want to talk about it. Um, when you see the person that it's involving, it's hard to look at them in the eye, you know, whether it's the person who would receive the injustice or the person that you felt was perpetuating it. So please take a moment and think about a particular situation. And we'll move from there to um, to working with it. Everybody got one? Here's the one that oh, it eats at me. There's my, one of my first OT students and many of, many of the students who came through our program have seen this slide before because it still gnaws at me that I had this you know student, this 24 year old white woman who came from a very privileged background, having this beautiful African-American woman use Tinker Choice as part of her um, part of her therapy session, you know, and how how disrespecting that was for her, who she was, the representation, the historical situation of slavery, just like being told you have to play with the child's toys as an adult. So that's the one that, that's the one that eats at me still. Um, that was a long time ago, but it's still there. Um, so when you think about your situation, um, if you're a student, you're likely to have had this be in one of these categories, systemic constraints, like how the, the policies and things, conflicting values, people have two different sets of values, um, both can be reasonable. And then witnessing questionable, questionable behavior. This is, this is something that students often talk about. These are things that keep coming up. And then failure to speak up, this feeling that they should have spoken up and they didn't. So this is a big aspect of the moral distress that, that OT students have. Now in 
uh, for OTs, they have the two big things that they uh, talk about are system, the systemic constraints, like the rules and policies, and then conflicting values. But they also have this huge responsibility. They, you, we, no, you, I'm too tired. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uphold ethical principles and values. I mean, that is a very big weight. We think about this. Um, upholding professional standards. You know, what would my profession think of me in what I'm doing or what I'm witnessing and not speaking up about? Um, we are dealing with interpersonal conflicts that have embed embedded in them uh, judgments, ethics. We're working with vulnerable clients. I mean, the responsibility we feel for their safety is pretty hefty. Um, now, you might be thinking of this in terms of how ethics plays against, uh, different ethical values play against each other, like balancing autonomy with safety, balancing your values with your client's values, balancing the colleague's principles and yours, and then your values and the employer directives, which is often what we think of as power in the situation, but that's only one possible thing. So think for a moment about what your story might be about. What of those things were, was your story about that you thought of? Um, Aldrich and Rudman talk about street, street level bureaucrats, and that's what we OTs are. We're enacting policies just like, you know, the, sometimes the tax collectors in terms of we feel that there's something that we must do. And we don't always feel that we're doing what, what we can do, what is most ethical. We're also operating in a situation of institutionalized racism, ableism, ageism, minoritization, and other things. This, we're very steeped in these systems and we don't even see them. But, well, increasingly we do. Um, and then we have this notion about safety as being physical safety. And really, you know, people in mental health practices are already thinking top emotional safety, but we don't fully grasp what it means to be culturally safe, to be a client who comes in and comes from another religion, another language, another culture, another sexual orientation and what it's like to uh, feel safe. Uh, I know we think about it, we talk about it, but I just kind of need, need to bring this in to set the context for the sort of distress that we experience. And then there's this principle of normalization of deviance. Once we get steeped in these sy systems, there's a very gradual process in which things that sort of seemed unacceptable either become invisible or acceptable to us. And then it becomes the social norm. Now the frog is a symbolic item, which many students might remember. It's the boiled frog concept. Is it as clinicians, we stay in situations and the, the temperature like frogs in water, the temperature is slowly <laughs> climbing. So there's this gradual process and we're not fully aware of what's happening in terms of racist, uh, homophobic, other kind of uh, things that happen within our situations. And so we don't know, we don't even think about it and we adapt to it. Now, students are, as you know, fresh frogs. You see that hot pot of water, you jump in and you jump right out. So they, in a way they can give us help, they can help us have fresh eyes on these ethical situations. Now, let's, that was kind of the introduction of our situation. It, does anybody want to comment? Does, is this making sense? Is it, yeah, okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk about power, moral courage, and advocacy. And basically what I hope to do is just kind of break down what each thing is somewhat comprised of. And when you break it down, you can handle it, right? That's what we do as OT, we break it down. So we're, first we'll talk about power, which is control, influence, and decision-making. Influence being a key word to keep in mind. It's not about winning, it's influence. Well, sometimes there's winning, but 
Okay. So types of power in organizations. What do you think of as types of power? I'm wondering if they're in the room, you could just shout things out and I'll repeat it. Administrators. Administrators, yeah, yeah. Capital. Capital, yes. Bordeaux's concept of capital. Oh, money, money, <laughs> money, oh yeah. <laughs> but also social capital. Social capital, <laughs> our relationships, yeah. And, and where we stand among our social network. So I'm gonna, now I'll read it to you. <laughs> this, this idea of position job role, the people who have the role of being our bosses, um, they have position power. Now in the business literature, do you know what they call that kind of power? Legitimate power. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, sorry, <laughs> but anyway, as if the other types aren't, but anyway, you know, the boss can tell you what to do, right? Then there's expertise, and when you're in healthcare and education, the expertise of the clinicians, the teachers, etc., um, have there's a certain power that you have, and then there's information power. Like, you know what's going to happen with the organization. You know the data on outcomes. You know this, you know that. So there's a power in that knowing that. Connections. This was, I mean, in my experience as administrator, connections was what I had. I had, you know, the head of social work was my best friend. My other best friend was the head of pharmacy. And my other best friend was the head of nutrition. So, you know, Connections, building our connections across that lateral strength we have, interdisciplinary wise, particularly. Respect, you have power if people trust you. If people don't trust you, you lose power. There's coercive power. <clears throat> now you think of that like, oh, the boss is gonna take away my vacation or my leave or my schedule or my this or my that. There's other forms of coercive power. And one of the most important ones in that is anger. We're afraid people will be angry at us. We give them power and being angry is a way of getting power over someone. I mean, it might come from, we might think a genuine emotion of being mad, but when you express it, it's to control you. So if that person, who is unhappy with you, won't look you in the eye or won't answer your questions or that sort of thing. They're trying to exert a coercive power over you. So, and we can use that, you know, it, you know, I'm, I'm leaving this situation. I'm not, we can use that coercive type power because um, we're nice and they're not, no. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, we punish each other. And then there's idea of reward. And immediately we think about money, right? You know, getting paid more, getting a better schedule, leaving early, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we give each other rewards all day long. We show appreciation for them. We acknowledge them. We manage up where we talk about you know, the strengths and appreciation for other people. So this is an important form of power for us to have. So important to think that it's not just the boss telling us things, but we are in the soup of lots of forms of power. So what I'd like you to do is take a moment and think about the dominant forms of power in your workplace. If everybody could. <clears throat> I think you were mentioning that a little bit, but how many people would say that position power is the dominant form? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Having Nancy as a boss. <laughs> how about coercive power? Is that very, is that used? People who, being in a sort of a hostile environment, okay. How about reward power? Yeah, right. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> Expertise, does that play out strongly? And in, yeah. Information power. Hands on the information. Best connections that we have. 
and then reset. It's important that we establish cultures and be part of cultures that elevate people who, you know, are trustworthy and respectable. So we sort of know who has them. So let's talk about your power. Who's, who thinks that their position is their strongest form of power? Okay, nobody. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Connections? No. Expertise? Um, for the people on uh, virtual side, we've just got people raising their hands in the room. You can raise your hand, but I can't see you. Um, <laughs> Respect. Yeah. Okay. So this um, this sociologist Pierre Bourdieu that was being alluded to by my colleagues, and it seems like a very academic principle. And yet, it's really it's really how the situations worked, and it's just another way of thinking about power as first of all social capital, like you know how powerful you are in terms of who you know and your, how you're viewed. And in the case of many institutions, racism, phobias, and all these things close the networks so people can't have power. Cultural capital, the norms get narrowed. You know, there are certain things about how, you know, you need to manage your time and how you need to look and all these things. The norms get narrowed in the situation of all this uh, disparity and power in institutions. Economic, you know, obviously inequity in resources for services and also for the providers, but, and also of course, with our clients. Um, symbolic capital, you know, who, who people represent their identities and stereotyping is one way to disempower people. Um, and, and limit their, their uh, potential to be part of the power structures. And then political capital, which is formed by lots of insular decision-making in which um, you, know, you just can't rise into the position where you have those powers. So why can't you just get over it, all you people who don't have power, right? Just, it's over, get over it. It's a fair place now, right? I was so taken by a talk by Senator uh, Canadian Senator Murray Sinclair, who is the First Nations, um, you know, American Indian, uh, his uh, background, and he said, "Why can't you always remember this? What my family has been through, that our gravestones are gone, that our children were stolen." that we were forced and beaten and, you know, so again, instead of why don't people get over their concern about this student, why can't everybody else remember it? So further, dominant powers influence what's considered ethical behavior. Like once once there's a, once there's a domination of, um, you know, roles, then ethics means you comply, right? Or if it's if if expertise is the dominant force, then ethics involve competence. And if teamwork is important, ethics is collaboration. And then in every situation, ethics is also speaking out. Um, so moving on to moral courage. Um, so. Moral courage is an action for moral purposes, and there's risk. If it's if it's not risk taking, it's not courage. It's just doing things. Okay, so I'm going to break down some pieces of uh, moral courage, uh, values, right? Values. We all think of that immediately. Awareness. So if we want to increase our moral courage, we've got to also work on our attention to what's going on, understanding and interpreting. We have to have imagination, moral imagination, to think in this situation, something could be better. That I can imagine, I can create scenarios 
where things can be different. And there are other possibilities. Moral courage requires judgment. Um, otherwise, it's a fool's caper to act on something that will just maybe further um, decrease the power in what you're hoping to do. And that requires understanding consequences and being discreet. Resolve. This word stuck. I mean, so many of us have moments and situations in power that we feel stuck. Like, how can we stop this? And, you know, we, we feel this in our personal life. We feel this in traffic. We feel this in our work. Um, and so we have to really have a sense of resolve that we're gonna get unstuck and take action. Hope. Being courageous means that you hope that something's gonna get better. And that relates to imagination, but it's a deep sense of faith in the world and people. And the moral arc of the university moves toward justice. So task number three is for you to think about your strengths in moral courage. What is, as you look at these six different possibilities, what do you see as the place that you are the strongest? I'm going to do a quick hand raise in the room. Is this uncomfortable? <laughs> yes, it is. No, it's a little bit. Okay, all right. No judgment. Okay. Who thinks your values are the greatest? <laughs> Wait, what'd you say? But unless it's your value, then you can judge. <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah, Ryan says, unless it's your values, then you can judge. <laughs> Kidding, of course. Um, so what are your strengths in moral courage? Um, how many people, okay, you can pick two, all right? <laughs> two top, okay? How many feel that their values are the top strength? Yeah, okay, all right. Very, fairly large number. Awareness, your awareness of what's going on. Slightly smaller number, about five out of 30-ish people, okay? Imagination, okay? Just a couple of people. Um, judgment. A couple of people. Okay. Resolve. Ooh, a lot of resolve hands. And hope. A lot of hope hands. Okay. So this is why we need each other. Because to resolve any, to work with any ethical situation, we've got to team up with people who have strengths in all of these things. So you got to look around you and find the person who's really got resolve or has an imagination or has values. Of course, we all have values, but like, um, so think about where you need support and build your team around people that will round that out and think about who can offer that support. So putting it together, if we assess moral courage in light of power, we can look at, oh, I forget what I was going to say. Okay. I, um, the, okay, that, that you're weighing sort of this internal thing of what's going on in you and your sense of moral courage and even within your team, and then having to move on to garner um, power in some ways based upon your moral courage because of how committed you are, how much imagination you have. And so, so you have to kind of be working both of these wheels and in your uh, calculation of how to approach a situation that's distressing. And sometimes it's one situation and sometimes it's uh, the situation of like, uh, the physicians never ask us if the patients are ready to discharge or you know whatever it is. That, that seems like it is creating a very big ethical problem for you. Um, okay, so a little bit about advocacy. 
All right. So this is an old fashioned picture. Um, this idea of concentric circles, the systems, microsystems, macrosystems, or meso and macro, um, you know, it's really important as you think about your ethical situation that's sort of on your mind to locate it in a sphere. Like, is it primarily some individual situation that you have with another person, another, uh, a client, a colleague, you know, what, whatever. So kind of locating it, is, is this really just like something that's within the sphere of certain people? Or is it something that's broader? Is it something that interdigitates with the team and how it functions? Or is it an organization level thing? Like this is how we're structured and this is how things are done here. And, and so on, or is it something in your broader community or broader policies? So <clears throat> how many people, when they were thinking of their ethical situation, excuse me, <clears throat> were thinking, had an example from an individual level? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay, two. Uh, team, the kind of the core of where the problem is, the ethical issues on your team, yep. One or two. Um, organization. Okay, now the OT faculty can't raise their hands. So. <laughs> organization. Yeah, that's that's a lot of, yeah. I know where some of you work and I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, and then um, community. Like the broader community around, you know, things like, oh, bias against people who are neurodivergent or you know, women's rights or whatever it is that, that you, you're finding. How many people kind of see it as a community level problem? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then, the, and you know, these things are all influencing down to the moment with the individual and then broader policies. Yeah, the policies. So, well, you all have kind of situated your, problem that you sort of started with um, in terms of a lot of things. Um, we'll be moving into that a little bit further. Let's go back to this OT practice topics and we can see how these themes were appearing at multiple levels. Um, these ethical points of aim, I started to say attack, but that's would you rude. Um, the, um, the point where you where they need to aim the the advocacy. So. Making sense so far? Well, good. Because now oh, well, you already did that. Aim your where you should aim your advocacy efforts. Okay. Got that. I hope folks who are uh, in the virtual sphere here are kind of taking notes and actively engaging with. Um, with these questions, because otherwise it's not going to be as useful or meaningful. Okay, I got ahead of myself. Okay, so now we're going to move into talking about it. Um, here are your instructions. Um, consider your uncomfortable situation and what injustice is happening. What level of system is key to advocacy? What types of power are at play in that situation, including yours? What are your strengths in moral courage? And then how can you enlist, enlist the support of others? So pulling through all these things, we're going to do a breakout in which um, I now have to talk. And <laughs> um, we're going to have our... Um, Mary Catherine is going to set up breakout groups of four to five for the people who are in the um, in the virtual space. And I would appreciate groups of three or four here to kind of go through these questions and see where you get. But before you do the questions, what questions do you have for me about how this would go? Does it seem pretty clear? 
In our process, the goal is to unpack power, unpack moral courage, think about levels of advocacy, and see what we need to do going forward. So through your example. Okay. We have about 12 minutes. Oh, Oh, you're our designated to me. Yeah. I I'm coming.
One more minute. So it's like that. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, 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 um, but um, we're going to just kind of have a conversation. Uh, Bridget will be looking at like, <laughs> passing the mic to people here and uh, then reading stuff in the chat. Okay. Thank you. I think is everyone back now? Yes. Thanks, no, Catherine. <laughs> okay. All right. You know, um, I, I always get advice and instead of telling stories, that was what I thought, let's just move right on to what your questions or thoughts are based on the conversations that you had. Yes. I'll say that our question. Oh. Mike coming. One of the questions that we arrived at was like, what if there are multiple kind of competing injustices at play at, that <laughs> conflict with one another or like, you know, like, and I guess I, I'm wondering where along the cycles one is supposed to evaluate, like, sh is, is it morally courageous to be fighting for this cause or am I actually making the wrong decision? Does that, does, if yes. that makes sense, like, mm -hmm. Yeah. There's not necessarily, we're not necessarily correct in our moral judgments. That's what I'm wondering about. You know, there are so many aspects of this, of moral situations. It's so much more complex than these two wheels, right? Because there's multiple, there's resources that get to one person and not another, and which is what's the justice in, in that. Uh, but I think that this idea of moral courage enlisting judgment, and that's writ large in terms of weighing, you know, where are you going to put your efforts? What, what power are you going to exert? Like that maybe is using up all your cards for a, a bigger issue that might come up. And there's just, there's, there's so much to ethics that this is just like just one window into a piece or a, a way to approach it. But I think that what you're describing is more of what therapists deal with all the time. Because if I give this person time, I don't, that person doesn't get it. If I advocate for this person to get a wheelchair, then that person might not. Yeah. Other, other comments, welcoming some comments. Thoughts? Yes. We also spoke about conflicting values and then like whose value is that value in a hospital setting if you've got a patient that can't communicate their values mm -hmm. and then their spouse is coming in with what they want mm -hmm. um and we are witnessing them misunderstanding mm -hmm. aspects of the care and what's going on and what's possible for this person uh and then certain healthcare providers and their values mm -hmm. and uh, and wanting to free up a hospital bed and things <laughs> like that. And, and also genuinely thinking that or feeling that in their experience that it's unethical to keep this person, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it, who's right there and how do you decide, you know? Yeah, <laughs> that's what makes it a moral dilemma. <laughs> you know, it's like two people who are being reasonable can disagree about what can happen. And, you know, I, I, there is a child in me that always thinks, well, let's just do the best thing or the right thing. And, it, and it's, it's not that. It's, 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 it's living life of, uh, 
away things, you know, you know I'm late for late. Do I drive really fast? And you know, I mean, and, and who's, is that risking? And, you know, just whatever, uh, just everything. I and mean, that's a simplistic description relative to that complicated situation of who knows what and what does each person believe and what do they understand about the potential and who else is being left out or deprived of something. Yeah. New team, right, Sarah? <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, you were just saying reasonable. So what is, where's the line for when you're going up against an unreasonable, unjust, and not ethically moral system? Um, like where's where's the line between like renegade who's kind of you know working within the system versus yeah. I am that going against my ethics to challenge the system. Uh, that's I think that's the big question. I think that really hits at the heart of the matter. That you know we've got to kind of weigh what battles we're going to cho choose to fight and what we're going to risk, but understanding power. Who has the power? Why do they have it? How can I get me some? <laughs> you know, uh, nope, that's not it. The, oh, I thought I thought maybe you were questioning that, but you know, but but you know, where where are the power sources, and how can I engage that power? How can I check what I believe should happen against? Um, the situation and other people's opinions, because I don't think anybody can be ethical in their own self in their mind. I remember giving a talk to a bunch of clinicians who and said, can you be ethical by yourself? And a couple of people were like, yeah, I can be so ethical as long as other people aren't. <laughs> Wait, you must think you're right. <laughs> but, and we, we might not be right dealing with uncertainty. But, but, you know, in terms of a way forward, breaking it down in terms of the power that surrounds you that, that is, you know, give and take and your, the dimensions of moral courage that you can enlist, um, there, there are ways forward in those, um, yeah, in those situations. But, I mean, I just I think having a team is always... And you might not agree with everybody in your team, which is a gift. It's a gift if you disagree with the people in your team because then you're going to be thinking broader. Um, do we have um, anything on the chat that we should? Oh, oh, we have another. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh. I was just going to follow up with that and say that I think um, we often see people wanting to be or feeling like they need to be like the warrior in a situation and that they go out and have to be the one to take on a situation of ethical sort of challenge or push and forget that that preparation time of building collective care and coalition building and thinking mm -hmm. about strategy and building a community around you who will catch you if you do go up against power and get pushed back down um, is a really important part of the process that I think systematically as a culture, we aren't taught because we're taught individuals are heroes, not communities. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to think about heroes in community mm -hmm. as well as the individuals who lead those communities. So mm -hmm. I think that's something that we have to think about when it comes to building um, coalitions and, and how we really connect with each other before we even try and make a morally courageous choice um, yeah. and how we sort of sit with ourselves as a, as a community first. Yeah, thank you. There's so much more power and wisdom in the collective. Um, so we do have, oh, okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to All right. uh, We do have one thing from the chat. I okay. to share it out. Okay, I think one of the things that was very clear from the discussion in my group is that you need other people to help you process and come to a reasonable solution for the current time. So my somewhat rhetorical question then is about managing the risks involved in trusting other people with your ethical question. Mm -hmm. Ethical questions are by nature personal. Mm. That's another excellent question and point. 
Here's my answer. Ask. Is it safe to talk with you about my, for example, you might say, is it safe to talk with you about my concerns about this situation? And, and can I trust you to, um, to, to work with me, to help me and to um, honor me by not sharing this unless we're, you know, so I think the direct approach, we, I'm slowly learning to say what's on my mind and what I need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's see. Let me move a little bit further. I'm going to, I no longer have power. Oh, let's see. Yes. Use I, your power, I've used up my power. Okay. So again, this really links to the things you were saying. Reconsider your situation as the single warrior and think about the different forms of power that you can have. And collective power is always stronger than single power. Um, and it's not just the math. It's the combination of people who are respected and have numbers. Um, and you can't always say. Uh, courage is imagination and advocacy is a collective process. So I hope you feel that you are aware of your own skills to analyze power, engage moral courage and, and with your team, and then balance and target your advocacy. I think we are made for this. I'd like a quick take home thought thought and I know we're we're just about out of time but take home thoughts what what are you going to take home and if people who are uh, people who are virtual if you would just write into the chat what you think you have um in this hour thought about that will be helpful to you in your practice maybe tell the person beside you take a minute and um think about one thing that you can take with you from this. Let yourself be a learner. And it might be something vague, like, well, I'm going to think differently about power. But, or it can be like, I'm going to go in tomorrow. No. <laughs> but okay, just take a minute for that, please. <laughs> And to you can also see more sides of it. Maybe it's a connection to get it. Because in both cases, even if you are actually Okay, thank you very much for being part of this conversation. Um, oh, I like it when y'all don't want to stop talking about it. <laughs> That's a compliment. <laughs> um, thank you so much for engaging with me. It's such a treat to be here with you. And um, just wanted to share with you the references that relate to this talk. And, um, and Bridget, um, my esteemed colleague, is going to uh, wrap us up. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Sue, for sharing your wisdom and your insight with us. We're so happy to see you. Thanks for coming out of retirement to be here. Um, so I'm Bridget LeCompte. I'm on faculty here. Um, just a few housekeeping items for you before you head out. First, thank you so much for your participation. We had, I think it was like 160 people online, which is great, and all of you here today. So thanks for showing up and participating. Can you um, move the thing down? Okay, who's going to mess with it? All righty. So on the right-hand side, if you would like a certificate of attendance, and even if you don't, we would really appreciate that you complete the survey. 
And this is really important so you get your certificate, but also to give us that feedback um, to help us engage in continuous improvement for events such as this. And then here on the left, this is the QR code. Um, please consider donating to help support future events, again, such as this one, which we're able to bring this to you for free, which is always great, right? Yes. All righty, and I think that's all I have. Okay, well, safe travels, and thank you for being here. Let us know if you need any help with the QR code. And online, I think the link is being shared as well. Thank you.